Hello and welcome back to Our Mind. In this sweet two-part series, I would like to have a discussion about self-esteem and its relationship with depression. And then in part two, we're taking a wee dive into desire. So self-esteem is an interesting one and likely one each of us can relate to in that we are probably all familiar with that little inner voice inside our minds that either says to us, hey, you know what? You're doing pretty well today. You're enough. You got this. You can trust yourself. I've got your back. But then more often than not, that inner voice might be saying something a little less flowery and a little more along the lines of you're not good enough, not doing enough, not earning enough, not looking good enough, not being healthy enough, not working hard enough. That little inner self-critic that dictates our self-worth. For some of us, this negative little critter in our minds is a little more prominent than for others. Beneath the inner voice, however, lies our very sense of self-worth, our self-esteem. According to some psychologists and researchers, there is indeed a train of thought that postulates that depression is, at its core, a disorder of self-esteem. Depression can be construed to be a kind of hidden or not so hidden lack of internal validity. In fact, Sigmund Freud himself was the first to ever suggest that depression is aggression turned against itself, a form of internalized violence. As he describes it, the savage of depression's assault represents the ego as worthless, inferior, incapable of any achievement and morally despicable, extending self-criticism into the past to the point of sleeplessness and refusal to take nourishment, and even more psychologically remarkable, going as far as overcoming the instinct which compels every living thing to cling to life. That is the power of such self-sabotage, self-hatred, or as we can call it, auto-aggression. This is, of course, the very depths of despair one might describe in something like an overt or major depression. Similarly to how we can have an autoimmune disorder, like our immune system attacking our own body, depression can be construed as the self attacking the self. When we have severe depression, this is overtly obvious. People suffer feelings of guilt, low self-esteem and worthlessness. But even more subtle, what about for people who aren't overtly struggling to get out of bed in the morning or burdened with thoughts of self-harm? In fact, quite the contrary. What about those who are driven excessively to succeed and to gain, to have and to win at all cost? I believe, in fact, that many of us are suffering with an underlying lowered self-esteem and there appears to be a universal increase in people's deteriorating sense of self, partly due to the modernization of our society. Furthermore, a low self-esteem may be driving many of our underlying behaviors. This is where, sometimes, the self-attack is attempted to be warded off with what we could call weapons of self-distraction. Let me explain. Let's first take a step back to describe what's a healthy self-esteem. What does it look like? It's essentially internal. The capacity to cherish ourselves despite confrontation with our own imperfections, not because of what we have or what we can do. It presupposes that we hold self-compassion towards ourselves even when we encounter pain and our own limitations, rather than hurting oneself with self-criticism or simply ignoring ourselves. It also involves recognizing that personal failure and suffering is part of being human. It does not mean that we are greater or lesser than another. But our overall sense of self is valued and importantly, our external attributes neither raises our self-esteem or allows it to fall apart. A brittle self-esteem, however, is dictated by external attributes and fluctuates with far less stability, often ending up well below baseline, depending on what our mind's inner critic decides to dictate. We aren't entirely sure where a low self-esteem stems from, perhaps lack of unconditional positive regard in parenting figures, personality traits like perfectionism, certain traumatic triggers, nurture, nature, our environment. But we certainly know that our modern world 
is perpetuating things to some degree and our economy seems to benefit from a seemingly deficient sense of self. In our modern culture, it demands that we forget our inherent sense of self-worth in order to prop our deficiency with external supplements such as materialism, status, beauty, wealth, etc. And these could be manifested in anything from spending, food, excessive work, achievements, porn, computer games, gambling, etc. All weapons of self-distraction. If we didn't need these things, the economy would likely collapse. The catch-22 is that the greater the deficiency in our self-esteem, the greater there seems to be a need for self-esteem supplementation. So a deadly combination of a brittle sense of self-worth with what society encourages us to value leaves a little room for true connection to ourselves and to others. It's difficult to identify these things from that which might be construed to be normal. In fact, many of these activities are often rewarded and expected in our society. Rather than an internal sense of self-worth, we become obsessed with things that can't replenish us despite an infinite amount of external validation or prestige. Like someone who loves his bank account, his power, prowess, work status or his good looks. It simply can't substitute for our own self-worth and this defense of reflected glory rarely succeeds but it won't mean we won't stop searching for the sense of untouchability or running from our secretly held vulnerability. I think that, in fact, subconsciously, many of us hold within us a denied sense of low self-worth, an ideation being bolstered by the way of our modern society. We tend to soothe our psychological wounds with external things like money, materialism, prowess and prestige. But such attempts aren't often successful and the underlying attack of the self is always threatening below the surface. Weapons of self-distraction are often held at the expense of authentic relationships where bearing real intimacy with others becomes difficult because we are unable to be emotionally intimate with ourselves, our innermost critic perhaps too harsh to bear. All in all, we are unable to identify all the various weapons of self-distraction that we might use to prop up our sense of self. We are, of course, all unique in that way, but we might be able to group it under the umbrella called desire. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is what we'll discuss in part two of this series. I'll see you there.